I got myself a new truck. Yeah, some assembly required. We'll start from the um, front, go to the back. What I've got here, I've got headlights, a heater box, fender wells, hood hinges, drive shafts, gas tank, fenders, grill, radiator support, original steering wheel, a seat, glove box lid, tunnel cover, sway bar, frame with good stuff on it. I see new U-bolts, I see a skid plate on the front axle. Now the tires have really good tread, they don't look worn at all, but um, the sidewalls leave something to be desired. The old 80s modular rim, Rusty, of course. Uh, I've got doors, both of them. A tailgate, another gas tank, more heater stuff, some random things, I don't know what they are. Uh, I've got a cab, and unfortunately, this glass was perfect until we loaded it up to bring it home, and uh, a little slip of a tractor caused that. So, uh, I'll get it fixed someday. But we've got a cab. The cab has a floor. One thing to notice about this is there's almost no rust on it. There's a tiny little spot on one fender and that's about it. Uh, back of the cab, hood, bed. That's the fuel door that was cut in for the extra tank. And uh, then I got a few boxes of parts, miscellaneous stuff. So um, somehow we're gonna piece this whole thing together and make it drive. One of the first things I want to point out is the timeline here. This was last registered, expiring in 96. Now this vehicle is a 1980. That means it was on the road for 16 years at the most. It is now 2021 and the end of it. So uh, that means it has been off the road for 25 years. So 16 on, 25 off. Which means this vehicle doesn't have a whole lot of wear because it wasn't actually driven that much. It only shows 50 some odd thousand miles on the odometer. And seeing it was taken apart when it was only 16 years old, that's plausible. You can see, it does not show too many miles. Look at the brake pad. That's barely worn at all. Gas pedal's barely worn. This uh, quite legitimately looks like a 50,000 mile truck just in pieces. I'm not even 100% sure where to start on this. I'm just gonna start throwing things together and see what happens. I think I'm gonna start with being able to move this frame around, which means four tires that hold air, and I gotta reconnect the steering linkage. That way I can actually move it where I want it to go. There, I got something done. Now obviously, we have a vehicle this far from being functional, the most important thing is making sure your wheels look right. Uh, I'm going to attempt a uh, matte hammered copper, because for some reason that seems like a color that will go well with that faded body, which I am not going to paint. I really think that will work. It's a lot cheaper than new wheels. Found a Severo sitting in the tire pile. So, perfect. I'm gonna pick a motor for this project. I am not gonna use the stock motor because uh, it has holes in the block. Apparently there are casting flaws in that block and when it was bored to be rebuilt, they found at least three cylinders have holes in them. So uh, that block is uh, gotta be massively sleeved and it's basically not worth saving. Also, the transmission is a three-speed automatic with no overdrive. And I like the overdrive, and I don't like automatics. So, uh, I don't really want to do that. So, I've got to pick a different motor. Now, I've got a couple options to choose from. This is that 5.2 Magnum I pulled out of my Grand Cherokee that I used for drag racing. And I only pulled it out a month or so ago, and it was running. So I know that'll work. Uh, I also have a 
spare five speed four wheel drive version and I've got a transfer case for that I think I got a 242 so um, I could put this whole 318 5.2 five speed with a transfer case that's got a real part-time and all-wheel drive. Uh, so that's not a bad option. The only thing is this starts off with like a four to one first gear. So it's not, it's more of a car-like transmission than a truck. Also, this particular transmission, I gotta keep because it doesn't shift into fifth or reverse. Uh, I think it's just the slider that it engages it or the yoke or something, I haven't gotten into it. It does have the first four gears forward though, so that's really, you know, the most ones you need. Oh, and it's got a fancy hearse shifter. I like that part. Though, not really useful on a truck application. This is another option. I originally bought this transmission and transfer case. It is a ZF5 speed from Ford. I think it was an early 90s pickup truck. And the reason I liked it it has a uh, real wide gear spread. It's down to a first gear of 5.72 to 1. So that gives you a nice low granny gear. And then the fifth gear overdrive is 0.76. So you got a wide spread, you got overdrive for the highway. Uh, it's a nice transmission. It's going to be very similar to the NV4500, which is a real popular one used in Chevy and Dodge. Uh, but this is way cheaper. I bought the transmission transfer case, drive shafts, Chip levers are here, he's got the whole clutch set up, everything he gave me for way less than you pay for a bell housing to uh, for NV4500. So uh, that was a deal and I bought that originally. Now this was behind the 351 Windsor, which is the same bolt pattern as the 300 straight six. And I really like straight sixes, I like the way they feel in a the truck, they got lots of torque down low, uh, makes it feel very truck-like. So I picked this one up on Marketplace. Uh, the guy had it running in his truck, so I uh, scheduled a time with him, he pulled it, I went and picked it up, and it was uh, fresh out of the truck. So it wasn't running and driving motor, so I'm not going to do anything to it except throw it in something. Now originally I was toying with an old Willys wagon or something like that for this drivetrain, but uh, this is a very good truck drivetrain. And it happens to have the output for the transfer case on the correct side for that Jeep. So uh, this one's definitely in the running. Here's another option, and this is probably my smartest move. This would make the best truck. That is a Dodge 360. Uh, I've got a 360 Magna motor. Uh, it's backed up by the 46RH transmission and a 241 transfer case. So all good solid stuff. This I have all pulled out of a cabin chassis truck. I have the whole wiring harness, and that truck only had 55,000 miles on the odometer. This is really the smart drivetrain. With a 360 matching the original 360, the transmission, this one's 727 base, that had a 727 in it. This has a whole 94 wiring harness, so it's a lot more modern. Um, and the mileage is about 50,000 miles in this motor, about 50,000 miles in the truck. Basically it'd be like driving a 94 Dodge with 50,000 miles on it in a Jeep body, which uh, really is ideal. And this project I'm going to go a different direction with now, so I need to yank this motor out anyway. I'm figuring I have so much room here and such easy access, this is the time to swap a motor in before I put the body on. So I'm going to go ahead and drop a motor in this thing and uh, then see if the body fits over the motor, because that makes sense. I realized I boxed myself in a corner here. I actually can't roll that frame this way with this bed here. I figure the bed won't um, affect me installing the motor, so I'm going to go ahead and change my order and throw the bed on next, then install a motor, then put the cab on. That makes sense. Now it's a truck. Looking at this DuraSpark module, it's already mated to this uh, Jeep truck wiring. That made the decision for me. Because uh, I realized ripping out the entire wiring harness and converting the truck to fuel injection is going to take a project that's already massive and turn it into something I probably won't actually finish. 
So just for the fact that I think it'll make me more likely to finish this truck, let's get in the Ford motor. That'll be the easiest one to hook up to the current wiring. And uh, it's a perfectly good motor for this truck. Nice big straight six, nice five speed. Uh, it'll work well. In the future, if I like the truck and drive it a lot and want more power, then I'll look at that 360. And then we can go to fuel injection and make it nice and fancy. But in the meantime, in order to get it moving to make sure I actually get this project done, let's get in the straight six. is roughly in position. The motor mounts are kind of lining up. I've got to figure out the fore and aft position on this thing, but um, I think I'm going to go grab the radiator support, see how that lines up the front of the motor. Since I don't have a cab on it, I know I need the motor to fit between the cab and the radiator support, so I'm going to try to get as far forward as I can on that one. Let me show you where I'm at here. I've got the motor kind of line up these motor mounts. Now these factory AMC mounts have four slots in them, so I can pick from top or bottom slot and move it back an inch if I need to. So uh, I'm gonna put it in the forward position for now before I fit the cab, and I can always move it backwards. I've gotta widen these slots just a little bit, the bolt's just a little bit bigger, but not much. I can just take a die grinder and zip, 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 that will clean that right up. Now, in the front here, I've got my core support. Let me give you a straight on shot. Looks like the radiator will fit and clear the pulleys. I'm not sure about, I'm not sure about a fan. Uh, that might be an issue, but we'll see how I mount the radiator and how that fits. But for now, I could probably get it running as is. The transmission cross member is way off. It's supposed to be, well, this motor needs a one over here. This one's way up. Also, this transmission is really high. So I think it's going to need to go down. So for now, I'm just going to unbolt this cross member. Probably use a tie down in the back so I can have some uh, support, but then adjust it up and down as needed as I fit the body. And then remount this cross member from underneath once the body's in place and the whole cab's on. This is a real long unit. I didn't realize how long it was. So the drive shaft's only going to be about three feet long, but that's not too bad. That's workable. And, uh... That's pretty much where we're at. Oh yeah, important thing, fitting the cap. Now I measured to the motor. I've got about 56 inches to where I would hit the firewall. And the cab, we have 56 inches right to where that um, body line is. Now we follow this body line over to about here. You can see the firewall is actually indented. So I think I will have the clearance I need to put this cab on. Here's a fun one for you. I need to open up the holes in those motor mounts before I can set the motor down and take the weight off this uh, hoist and move anything. The die grinder I need to open that up is in this drawer. Oops. Should have thought of that one ahead of time. There it is. I can see it, but I can't reach it. Not the tool I wanted to use, but We'll make do.
cab on. And uh, everything looks like it pretty well fits. I haven't actually bolted the cab down yet. I gotta adjust it to fit the body mounts, but they're in the ballpark, we're pretty close there. A uh, couple little minor issues of rubbing. Now the motor's really close to the firewall in one spot. One tab is hitting, but I think when I bring the back of the transmission up, this might clear. Worst case scenario, it doesn't look like this is important for the manifold, so I could always saw that off if needed. Now, the only other issue I have is pretty minor. Um, the transfer case linkage. So the transfer case linkage hits, but I can just unbolt that whole... This whole thing can unbolt, so I'll just come up with a different transfer case shifter than this one. I'll just take that off. So, uh, basically I'm going to take care of that transfer case shifter, pull the back end up a little bit, that might clearance the front, then bolt the body down, and we have a truck that looks like a truck. Uh, I'm sorting through all the miscellaneous boxes of parts I got with this thing, and uh, I'm definitely missing stuff. I know I'm missing bolts, I'm missing a few other things, and I'm not even sure what else I'm missing. I also have extra stuff. Some things are painted a different color, so I'm pretty sure they don't go to this vehicle. Maybe. Or maybe they do. I don't know. Um, so this is going to be fun. It's kind of like doing a puzzle, except some of the pieces are missing, some pieces are from another puzzle, and you don't know what the picture looks like anyway to your building. Uh, so the good thing is, we can cut and weld the pieces. So, you know, we're going to win. Got the transfer case linkage disconnected. Um, for now, I'll just leave that. I'll figure out what to do once I get everything finalized. I uh, need to make a cross member here. And uh, I'm just going to reuse the factory one. There it is. Just going to reuse the factory one. Looks like I can add a couple holes in, it'll be fine. And then I'm going to have to drill new holes in the frame in order to match these, but. Uh, Looks like I got plenty of room to work with, so just a few holes and uh, we'll have this thing all bolted in. Now this is the pile of drive shafts I have to work with. These bottom two came with the transmission and they fit the transfer case, so I think those are originally from that Ford truck it came out of. That one also came with a transmission, but doesn't seem to match anything. So I think that is something unrelated. And those two are the ones that came with this Jeep truck, but are for a transfer case that I'm not going to use. So, I have to make something that drives me out of these. So that end will fit the transfer case, so I need that. This end, that has a center bearing. There's no way I'm going to have that center bearing spinning free. And this Jeep is way too short for the whole thing. So I'm going to split off that end and then see what I have uh, as far as length. This is the yoke I just pulled off that drive shaft, cleaned it up a little bit so it doesn't gouge up the seals when we run it. And let's hope this really is the right one. Uh, it looks like it'll fit. It's not going in very far. This didn't go on the first time because there's rust inside those splines. This would be the ideal time to clean those off while it's out and uh, easily accessible. So what I'm going to do is spray some oil on it and uh, just tap it in and assume it'll all work out fine. Already working better. We need 37 and a half inches. So, let's see what we got. Huh. 36 and a quarter. So that is an inch and a quarter less than our complete maximum compressed on that slip yoke. Which means that only has to slide out an inch and a quarter. That might do. There. That looks good. Now let's see about this other end. Oh yeah. That looks pretty good. Except for the fact it doesn't fit. Uh, length is good, but these U-joints are two different sizes. The Jeep uses a smaller U-joint. Um, let's see, I've got to do a little digging, but I bet they're standard sizes. Now this Jeep is a half ton. 
this transmission came out of a three quarter ton truck so it makes sense it would have bigger u-joints but being how one's a jeep and one's a ford they probably use fairly standardized things and they make adapter u-joints that have one set of pins being one size and a different set of pins being the other size so i bet i can get one new u-joint which unfortunately i'm going to, have to buy i don't have one of those but um i think that'll make this whole thing work got my adapter u-joint in and this is one that has one side being the larger ford style the other side the smaller jeep style uh, and this will be fine for a half ton this was set up for a three quarter but i wanted to reuse the drive shaft since it's already balanced and uh done so i don't have to actually spend money on that all right come on you'll fit there we go there we are she's in there so it's about an inch out from fully bottomed so that gives us a little room that way i think i have like three inches this way to go so we're in good shape got the adapter u-joint installed in case you need it the part number is 5-134x and uh i think i paid 16 bucks at rock auto plus shipping all right so whole drive lines in motors bolted in trannies bolted in uh drive shafts bolted on we get this thing running we can drive it with you know some minor things like brakes and clutch and stuff like that but other than that we'll be able to drive it realize that before I drop it down, I should probably see if the transmission and transfer case have oil in them. Uh, I don't know what kind it takes. I don't know how much it's supposed to have, but I figure some is a good amount. Now, a good transmission dipstick is old zip ties, especially the white bad ones. They're great because they show up oil real well. Oh, it's down there. Oh, there is some. See how you can see it easy on that stick? Um, there's some in there. It looks like it's ATF. So I'm going to assume everything's fine. Good enough for now. I can maybe change it or you know, just completely ignore it, which is probably what's going to happen. Got a broken bolt. I'm going to need to extract that and clean up the threads before I can put this hinge in and actually mount the door. All right, we're good now. Now, this is the power steering pump that came with the frame. It's still attached. This is the power steering pump that came with the motor. I just took that pump off to make it easier to install the motor, but it looks like there's plenty of room now that I got it in here. Now, what do you think the chances are that high pressure line will unbolt directly from this pump and go right in that one? I'd say slim, but not none. That's not sealing. But, let's see what I can do. It's probably gonna be easier to adapt that fitting then to adapt that pump onto this motor. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this pump in place, make sure everything else fits. And as long as it looks good there, I'm gonna get some way of adapting this in. Cause that hose looks pretty shady anyway. All right. Well, I got some problems here. Um, the power steering, the pump from the Jeep, completely different fitting than the pump from the Ford. So I gotta figure that out. That's fairly minor, you can do that with adapter fittings. This is a bigger problem. My clutch master cylinder. This is the one that came with the transmission, so it's a Ford version. Um, I have a giant brake booster and electrical connector right where I want to put this. So um, it, it's not gonna fit. There's no way that's happening. Now I looked into a few options, including making a whole linkage going to this, but I realized these two problems are related because what I can do is use my hoses from the power steering pump, and I have to adapt them anyway, go to a Hydra Boost, which is a hydraulic booster unit, which is much smaller than this vacuum booster. And that'll clear up this spot here, so I can put this master cylinder right there where I want it. So, that means I have to get a Hydra Boost system, but uh, they should be readily available. I can buy them online, but I want to go cheaper than that, so I'm going to check junkyards. Um, so i got to remove this, remove the master cylinder, remove the vacuum booster, then I can figure out where that clutch cylinder is going to go. And I'm going to keep it as far to this size as I can to make room for the hydro boost. I don't have it yet, and I don't know what size it is. And after I get all that done, then I'll figure out fittings for the power steering, 
to uh, actually make that all hook up and power everything. manual brakes for now. Does that line up? Yeah, we can just bolt this right to the firewall. We're just going to go manual brakes, just do a little power assist delete. I'm sure that won't be a problem at all. I'll eventually get to fixing that, probably. Now if you've seen my videos on the ZJs where I do manual transmission swaps, you probably already know that I make a reproduction ZJ clutch pedal bracket. Um, that one and uh, that uses a TJ pedal that I modify to work just like a ZJ pedal. The reason that's relevant is in order to get those TJ pedals to modify I have to buy TJ pedal clusters. When you buy the TJ pedal cluster you also get a brake pedal. That means I have uh, a lot of brake pedals. So anytime I do something that involves a pedal and I need to make a new one I use a TJ brake pedal. So this thing's getting a TJ brake pedal for both the brake and the clutch. This right here is the factory setup for the brake pedal. Now in the bracket, the factory bracket, one end's a straight hole, the other end is this sort of D shape. So I'm gonna take this collar, I just drilled the weld out, pulled the collar off, and I'm gonna uh, save all those parts in case I need to uh, ever put this back to an automatic. I can just weld this piece back on. So this is what I'm replacing with. I made a TJ brake pedal look basically like the factory brake pedal as far as the shape and where the pivots are. And I got the factory TJ bushings in there. Cut down TJ bolt. That's going to slide in there. Then the J10 spacer is going to go where it belonged. That um, D-shaped collar. I'm going to put on the other side. So now this is going to fit in the bracket that's under the dash. That's going to go through a regular hole. This is going to go through a D-shaped hole. Everything here is going to work just like it did when it was an automatic. Now I'm going to add this TJ brake pedal modified to become a clutch pedal. Factory bushings again. And that is going to go on the outside right here. And that's going to slide there. Then I'm just going to put on a washer, giant cotter pin to hold all that in place. And so basically this is going to fit just like the factory unit did. This is going to bolt right into the bracket. This one's going to add on top. And I didn't get my pedal heights quite right. I actually cut this one first, then decided to bend it a little further. So this one shortened up, but I can replace it. All I have to do is remove this cotter pin. I can pop this one off, but I'm going to leave it for now and try it out and see how I like it. So, this is going in now. Somehow, I gotta fish this all in there. This is what I've got. Here's my brake pedal. Here's my clutch pedal. They've got a tiny little bit of play, not too much. Running on factory bushings on, running factory bushings on the factory mounts. Not 100% sure this is my final pedal spacing. Um, I sort of think this one, I moved it a little too far. I should have gone straighter. But, like I said, I'm going to try it out, see how it works, drive it. At least it'll function. And I can always pull off the cotter pin on the end and pop a new pedal in here. Easy. So, uh, no problem. Kind of looks like it's supposed to be there. Basically all deep parts, all matches. And, uh, I didn't use anything except leftover parts I had lying around. And now, I'm ready to install the clutch cylinder. Now, on the outside, got to pop a hole in the firewall for the clutch master cylinder. And I've got an approximate distance away from the brake master cylinder. And I'm looking, all right, there's a reinforcement plate spot welded to the firewall right in the area I want to be. And there's a reinforcement rib. So I'm going to put the hole just inside the rib. Uh, so that should be close enough. The clutch cylinder's in there. Uh, ended up, I had to trim off the side of the plastic on the cylinder just to clear this rib. I could have flattened the rib, but I'd rather keep the Jeep intact and I don't really care much about the forged stuff. But, uh, so that's in place. I made up a rod for the, um, the brake cylinder. Even though I don't have a power booster, at least they'll work. Then, 
I made up a rod for the clutch cylinder. Now this is the rod that was on there. It was just about an inch and a half too long. So I just uh, seconded it out, added a little weld in there. And uh, we're gonna install it and see if we have a clutch. Moment of truth here. Install that. Drop this down. Bushing's installed. The clutch pedal is around the same height as the brake pedal. Oh, I heard something in the transmission move. Yep. I think we got a clutch. So, clutch, brake. Uh, no gas pedal working yet, but that's just a cable. That'll be easy. But uh, we made some big progress. Now I can actually drive this thing. Huh. Well, I've run into a problem. My starter doesn't fit. Now, come to find out, Ford uses two different starters for this kind of thing. Um, one for a manual and one for an automatic with this number of teeth in the flywheel. I think it's 164. Um, I need the starter from a standard because um, that kicks out the right amount. On the standard starter, the gear kicks out just a little bit. On the automatic, it kicks out further, which is no big deal because I have the standard starter that came with my manual transmission. Problem is, this boss that has to fit inside the backing plate uh, the dust cover on the motor is a different size. This one's too big. The hole that I need to go into is four inches and 90 thou. The starter that goes into it is four inches and 120 thou. So I can't physically put that starter in. If I went the other way, had a manual transmission backing plate, the starter would have fit because it would have extra clearance. Now, the time to fix this was when I had the backing plate off doing other modifications. But it's on, and I don't want to take this off. So I'm going to modify it in place and make this hole bigger. Hopefully without damaging that brand new flywheel. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. I actually want this slug. Now I'm going to do, so I'm actually taking out this pilot bit and installing this slug. And this wooden slug is going to become the new pilot because my hole is already right about this size. I just want it a little bit bigger. So, let's see which way it fits best. Uh, I'm probably gonna have to put a spacer to hold this out. You know, maybe I'll put a spring in there. This is a piece of foam tubing I had lying around. I think from a fender stand or something. I'm gonna shove that in here. Then shove this in. Let's see what it does. And yeah, that can compress all the way down. So I can cut through it and then springs back. That's just what I need. Spring loaded pilot. Now here's my wooden slug. It just happens to fit right in that hole that exists there. Now this hole saw will be piloted by that slug and take out just a little bit of material all the way around it. So in theory, this should work. I'm having trouble with the pilot staying seated, so I added a couple of aluminum shims to push that plate out a little bit, and uh, that way the pilot will go in a little deeper. That's what I removed. So I've got a little bit off here. I'm gonna pull out those shims and make sure the starter fits. Yep. Starter goes in there. So now we just gotta bolt it up and see if it works. Quick test of the starter. This Jeep actually used the original style wiring with the solenoid is the same as what the Ford uses. So I just wired it right into the factory wiring. Now, I'm gonna see if I can just hit it and get something out of the starter, crank the motor over. But the motor turned over, which means we can get this thing running now. So now I'm at the point of getting this thing running. Apparently I don't need my DuraSpark box yet because this has what's known as a TFI ignition, which has a module on the side of the um, distributor. Now, apparently you can trigger these manually with just power and a coil wire. Uh, it doesn't have a computer control. It doesn't adjust the advance properly, but it should run. So we're gonna try to hotwire it. Thank you. 
found myself a TFI module wiring diagram. So I'm gonna assume all I need is a ground, a coil wire, and hot. We're gonna hook it up like that, see if we have spark, and see if we can get this thing running. I've got my module wired up, and I figure I have a pretty good chance of blowing up this module with what I'm doing, because I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just hooking up wires. So I did put an inline fuse, a little two amper. So that will, it might blow. I don't know how much power the module takes, but I'm assuming it's not too much. I ran the coil with a separate real wire. Uh, no fuse at all, because, you know, why not? I think I'm ready to put a battery in, crank it over, and see if we got spark. There. Completely secure. I've disconnected all the factory wiring just because I don't know what it is. Um, a lot of it's disconnected, a lot of it's uh, sun damaged, so there's no insulation. So we're gonna worry about that later. We're just gonna go ahead and put a straight up proper ignition system on this. Yep, apparently I got a bad solenoid here. So much for the original wiring. So far, none of it has worked. Good thing I got a spare solenoid with that starter. I've got the new style one, so let's swap that out. Let's see if we get some turning over. All right. Sounds terrible, but turns over. And I got my spark test over there. We got spark. Gotta add a little gas here. Because we might actually be able to start this thing soon. Like now. -ish. Let's figure out what happens. It's gonna run. That starter sounds really horrible. So we're just gonna completely ignore that. Um, and just keep going. So I need to get some more fuel in there, because I think we're going to make this happen. Almost there. Alright. Timing seems off, which is not surprising, because I think it's supposed to use a computer to set it. So I may have to fiddle with that, but I think at this point I want a radiator hooked up to this because we're doing something here. I think this is going to keep running for a while, get it warmed up. Yeah, this is an old Dodge Dakota radiator right lying around. I have to cut off one flange. Looks like it'll work. The inlet and outlet in the right spot, and that's the main thing. Now eventually I'll probably cut off these tabs and have to lower it a bit to make it fit really properly. But uh, this might be enough to just keep it running and keep it cool while I get it tuned. Hey, hose damper is even the right size. I can use the factory Ford hose. Yeah, well, looks like I got most of the coolant system kind of cobbled together here. There's a few kinks. A few of them don't quite fit right, but looks like it'll be good enough. So at least we can get some water in this motor and keep it running for a while without worrying about damaging the block or head. So let's add some water and see what happens. Why don't you guys keep an eye on that side of the motor and tell me if you see anything going wrong so I can shut it down. Alright, now it's not running right. Uh, it could be a fuel mixture issue because I think there's a bunch of lines that are disconnected. Also could be a timing issue because I know this was supposed to have a computer to run the timing and uh, it's probably not set right. So, um, at least now I can run it enough to check the timing and then fiddle with the car. So, probably should get this wiring to work a little better though. I want to put some kind of exhaust on this thing, um, mainly to direct the gas out of the engine compartment and away from all the wires and stuff. Uh, I dug around, I found a ball socket on a Chrysler manifold. I don't know what it's from but it's pretty close in size. It's a little big, but it fits pretty decent. Uh, I think what I'm gonna do is just trim off the front edge and I think that it'll fit fine. Just took a, whoa, that's hot. Just took a little tiny ring off. Not much is needed. Now this should fit and still have plenty of meat for the clamp to grab. Got a spare bit of YouTube from Project Frogger. That'll probably work. I need a 90. That. It's gonna go something like that. 
and this is going to go something like this and uh yeah that kind of looks exhausty couldn't get the stock exhaust to work so go into the glass back these fit everywhere the crimp and the bend nicely brings it down from a two and a quarter to a two inch i'll be able to fit that okay of course, we're going to use the proper hanger method. There. Done. Exhaust is handled. Done a few more things. I got the wiring tidied up a little bit. I also included the electric choke in with the wiring, so that turns on when I put power onto it. And I found I had a vacuum leak. Uh, this was attached to the manifold. It was lots of leaks, so I just replaced the whole thing with a plug. So, problem solved. Okay, I've got button for the ignition on a wire long enough to run inside. A button for a starter. Starter still sounds terrible. But... This is the original throttle cable from the AMC. Um, there's no way that's going to match that carburetor. So I got the Ford throttle cable, which is considerably longer. It has a different hookup to the pedal, but I figure that uh, shouldn't be too hard to adapt. And it has the correct hookup to the carburetor, so uh, that's perfect. Kind of interesting, this is the AMC cable, this is the Ford cable. Both of them use the same kind of plastic uh, clip that goes on the gas pedal and the same cable system. So really, these are pretty compatible. The only difference is that it has those tabs that lock in the firewall. This has two holes, but I can see a tap screw going right in there. So uh, what I'm looking at here, the Ford one has one, uh, one ferrule here and another one down there. I think I'm gonna try to take this deep clip, put it on this back ferrule, and that might be the length I need. So I took a hacksaw, made a, I took a hacksaw, made a little slit in this ferrule, and uh, we're gonna see if that works to attach the pedal. We'll just leave this part hanging free. I don't think it'll affect anything. There we go. That's all done. All right, let's see if it works. Yeah. There we go. On to the front end. Got his face back. Now, you may have noticed I cut a few corners here and there. There's a few things that are left to be done. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, we don't have power brakes. Uh, we don't have brakes at all because the master cylinder is frozen solid. We don't have power steering. Uh, we don't have a transfer case lift lever. We don't have any electricals inside, no gauges, no lights. Um, some of the bolts are missing nuts on things like the leaf springs. Uh, the brakes and calipers are loose, uh, don't know why. Uh, there are only two bolts holding the bed on and only one of those has a nut on it. Um, there's a few things left to be done. But today is Thanksgiving and it's not a day to think about what you don't have. Today is a day to think about what you do have and be grateful for. I have a cool looking truck with a nice five speed and one of the most durable truck motors ever made under the hood, if I had a hood. It, it'll fit after I change the radio around. But the other thing here is this truck has been off the road for 25 years and in pieces most of that time. 
Uh, it very easily could have turned into a parts vehicle and just been parted up for other people's projects. But right now, I am going to see if this thing will drive under its own power for the first time in 25 years. So uh, let's see if that happens. Then we're going to call it success or a failure if it doesn't. But I think it's going to work. It's running. That's it. I'm calling this one a win. It drove. Uh, the drivetrain seems like it'll be fine. Uh, now I gotta get to all those other little details. But I have good inspiration to work on them because now at least I felt the drive. Um, sometimes if you make a project too big and don't have a good milestone like driving it, uh, you give up and it never gets done. And that's what I needed to keep it being fun to work on. I needed a win like that and uh, I need the inspiration of being able to drive it. So now I'm going to keep having fun with this project. You guys keep having fun with yours. We'll see you next time.